We're going to turn to a story in the book of Genesis. I think my big, here's my big Bible. Sure, Scott. You know, my parents tell me when they were ki- they were, they were kids, they didn't have things called backpacks, and they had to carry their books like this all over campus, all over Texas Tech. So, if you're ever complaining, just that's one thing you don't have to complain about. Genesis chapter 41 is a story of a man named Joseph. At 41, 38 through 46. And um, something happens right before the story that's important for you to know so that it makes sense. Uh, Pharaoh is, is Pharaoh. He's the most powerful human on earth. I joked before with our first service, except for Moses. Apparently Moses is more powerful than him later in the story, but it's a different Pharaoh then. But at this time, Pharaoh is the most uh, secularly powerful man on earth. And he is, uh, has a, a dream, a recurring dream that's been terrifying him. Um, have you ever had that kind of dream that you just wake up from and it's freaking you out? Well, imagine that happens to you every time you fall asleep for like a year. So he can't sleep. His peace has left him. And he, uh, he hears about a guy named Joseph. And Joseph is who we're going to be reading about today. Joseph is locked away in prison. And he's also a blessed man by the Holy Spirit. And Pharaoh learns that this man is in his kingdom and, and is a, a great asset for Pharaoh. So Pharaoh says, why not? And tries this guy. Uh, Joseph actually interprets Pharaoh's dream and, and not only tells him what, what the dream means, but what he ought to do about it. And you'll see what happens to Joseph because of that. And Pharaoh said to his servants, Can we find such a man as this in whom is the Spirit of God? So Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since God has shown you all this, there is none so discreet and as wise as you. You shall be over my house, and all your people shall order themselves as you command. Only as regards the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, Behold, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring from his hand and put it on Joseph's hand and arrayed him in garments of fine linen and put a gold chain about his neck. And he made him ride to ride in his second chariot. And they cried, cried out before him, Bow the knee. Thus he set over him all the land of Egypt. Moreover, Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without your consent, no man shall lift a hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh called Joseph's name Zaphnath Paneah. And he gave him in marriage Asenath, the daughter of Potipharah, priest of On. So Joseph went out over the land of Egypt. Joseph was 30 years old when he entered the service of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went throughout the whole land of Egypt. We know these words to be trustworthy and true. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, we, we know that we do not live by only bread, but by words that you feed us. We know that your word provides us a lamp to walk by, a light for our path. We pray today that you would feed us and that you would show us the path using your scriptures and using your word. To do this, we ask that you pour into me the gift of preaching and that you pour into your people a hunger and a thirst to be fed by your word. We ask these things always in the name of Jesus, your son. Amen. So Joseph had an interesting early life. He's 30 years old when this happens to to him. Before that happened, he had a lot of ups and downs. If you're familiar with the story, uh, you're going to get a little recap. If you're not, here you go. Uh, Joseph was a uh, brother to, to lots of other sons. They all had the same father. His name was Jacob. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. The 12 sons of Israel, including Joseph, well, his kids, long story. But the 12 sons of, jo- of, of Israel become the 12 tribes of Israel, okay? Uh, Joseph, out of all the sons of Israel, was favored the most. And it wasn't like a secret thing. It wasn't like... He was getting a dollar under his pillow every night. 
it was an overt uh, Israel, the, the dad, uh, was, was giving, he gave him a, a beautiful coat. Have you all seen the Technicolor Dream Coat, that production? Yeah. He gave him the coat. He gave him all these great things. And then Joseph uh, made the mistake of sharing with his brothers all the cool things that are happening in his life. Have you ever, have you ever heard somebody bragging? Not bragging, but like sharing about all their blessings and you just want to hurt them? Um, well, that's what Joseph's brothers thought. And so they, they did hurt him. They, they threw him in a pit. And they tried to kill him, and then they realized that better than killing him, it would be better off if we sold him into slavery. That way we're not guilty of murder, and he's out of the picture. So everyone wins, except Joseph. And so they sold him into slavery, and Joseph ends up in a slave uh, train, and it takes him all the way to a foreign land that we now know as Egypt. He's sold to a man named Potiphar. He ends up being an incredible servant. He's the kind of guy that even though he sold into slavery, he says, well, I guess this is what I'm doing now. And he did a good job. Can you imagine? He worked hard. He, elevated, he was elevated up to, to be uh, very trusted by Potiphar. Well, another thing happens to him while he's living with Potiphar. Potiphar's married. And she thinks Joseph is just so cute. And uh, she comes after him one day and, and tries to seduce him. And he spurns her advances. Well... Uh, she, that's right, and uh, she uh, she uh, she's so shamed by what happened that uh, she turns around and says that Joseph was the one who was putting the moves on her. Okay, and and who 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 are you going to believe? Your wife or a servant, right? So Joseph um, Joseph was thrown back in prison, back in enslavement, um, and and so something happens between that imprisonment and, and Pharaoh, I don't have time to get into it this morning too much, but several visions and dreams occur and God elevates Joseph so that he is actually standing in the presence of the king, the most powerful man on the earth at the time. And it's interesting because while Pharaoh is the most powerful man by, on, on paper, he's powerless in this situation. He's haunted by a dream that's stolen his peace and Joseph holds the power. It's a big role reversal. And Joseph shares the vision, what it means, and what, what Pharaoh ought to do about it. And Pharaoh gets so excited about him, he takes this prisoner, and he's seen that he's an asset to the kingdom. And Pharaoh does what any wise leader would do. He gives him a job. And not just any job, he gives him a job over all of Pharaoh's responsibilities. When Pharaoh, as king of the land, uh, as, as chief over the entire land, Pharaoh is responsible for what happens in his kingdom. That's kind of a no-brainer. He's responsible for, for making sure the borders are safe, for the, the military is going out to fend off the, the foreign territories, that, uh, that people are being fed, that the laws are being upheld, that work projects are being done. You name it. I'm glad I'm not a public servant. It's a big job. So that's Pharaoh's job. He's responsible for all of these things. And he gives Joseph charge over it all. He tells Joseph, the only difference between you and me is that I'm on the throne. But I'm going to give you my ring. I'm going to give you my Texas Tech ring. You know I'm not wearing a Texas Tech ring. <laughs> I'm going to give you my ring. And when people see the ring, they know that when you speak, it's as if I'm speaking, says Pharaoh. I'm going to give you my robes, a gold chain. I'm going to give you a chariot out of my second best chariot. I'm going to give you the second greatest seat in the kingdom. I am going to give you the seat of steward. You know, the word steward was actually not around when this story was first told. This word steward wasn't around after when Jesus told all the parables. You know, out of all the parables he tells, all the lessons he teaches, he teaches about one thing the most, the kingdom of God. What's the second most thing he teaches about? Stewardship. Weird, huh? He teaches about stewardship more than prayer. And when the Bible was written... It was written in Greek and Aramaic, New Testament in Greek, Old Testament in Hebrew. When it was written, uh, the Greek used a certain word that Jesus would plug into these stories. And later on in time, during the feudal times, you know, in the old, we have a history people in here, back in, in, in old Europe, where you had uh, a different set system set up, like Pharaoh had his own system set up. We have our own system now. Back then they had a different system. And, and communities were, were, were broken up in terms of the size of probably about counties as we have today. We're, is this Lubbock County? I'm still learning. We're living in Lubbock County, county seed. Um, and, and that's where the name count from. You know, 
to be a duke or a count. A count was in charge of accounting. Well, back in the feudal times, people that were in charge of an entire swath of land that would be the size of a county was called a lord. A lord. And they lived in the biggest castle in town. They were born into it. Their dad was lord. And their oldest son's going to be lord after them. And they had all this responsibility for taking care of what was back then called the peasants. The people, there were the haves and the have-nots. The people who lived in the land. He was responsible for making sure they were fed, that they were offended, that they were taken care of. And in order to carry out that job, there was another guy in town. Sorry, ladies, there's always a guy. We'll say ladies now. There was another person in town that lived in the second biggest castle. And their name was, they were given the title of steward. They were the steward. It's a feudal time word. Okay? And the steward was an honorable position. It was the highest you could get in life, career-wise, without being born into royalty. That would be most of us. We're not born into royalty. And so the best job you could get in your lifetime, the most honorable job, the best paying job with the most benefits in that system was to be the steward. Does that make sense? It's amazing. You know that song, Mamas Don't Let Your Babies Grow Up to Be Cowboys? Let them be stewards and doctors and lawyers and such. Is that what it says? Right. You would want your kid to grow up to be a steward. You'd, you would be proud, maybe jealous, if your brother was a steward. Uh, it meant a lot to be, to be entrusted with that responsibility. It meant the king, the lord of that manor, the lord of that county, trusted you. Well, lo and behold, one of the most famous versions of the Bible was written in 1611, translated in 1611, after that word steward had been around for about 400 years. And they could have chosen any word to plug in when Jesus talks about a manager. They could have used the word uh, uh, manager of subway. They could have used an accountant. They could have used a parent. They, they could have used different words. But the, the people who wrote and translated what we call the King James Version of the Bible chose to use the word steward. Steward. An honorable position that we would be charged with these things. Of course, the word Lord was used everywhere instead of king or empire or emperor. Okay. And so the word steward in the scriptures, when it's used in the New Testament and when it's used in this Old Testament story between Pharaoh and Joseph, it's an honorable position. And this month, we're, we're doing a focus on stewardship. And I know the deal. I've been in church a long time. And uh, most of my life, I wasn't a preacher. And so when the preachers started talking about stewardship, I would glaze over and say, let's just hurry up and get this over with. Um, but, but today, it's important um, that, that we grasp this basic image of truly biblical stewardship, like we did with worship. Remember, the goal of worship is to bring your heart close to God. Today, I'm, I'm, I'm pushing and selling and, and, and hopefully revealing to you a basic biblical image of what it means to be a steward. And the first thing I'd like to say is, if somebody finds you worthy of being a steward, that is an honor. It's an honor. Well, you had the stewards in the feudal times with their lord who owned everything. You have Joseph, who's in relationship with Pharaoh. And then you have us, and we're in relationship with God. That's the, that's the parallel. And one of the biggest important things to recognize uh, between Joseph and Pharaoh and us and God and a, and a steward and the Lord um, is that while, while the stewards are given the incredible benefit and honor of getting to... Uh, uh, distribute and deploy and use the, the owner's stuff for the good of the, uh, for, of the community, it's important that we never once start believing that all the stuff we're entrusted with belongs to us. Right? If Pharaoh learned, which is, this happens in the scriptures and other stories, where the chief steward mishandles things or is, is a bad guy. I uh, almost said a bad word there which is a bad guy, you know. Uh, if they learn that, uh, easy come, easy go. You know, you're not guaranteed the position of stewardship, the position of steward. Uh, and in Joseph's sense, if, if Pharaoh learned that Joseph uh, got lazy after a few years, started kicking his feet up, eating more of the food than he was distributing, that sort of thing, spending it all on himself. Do you remember the, uh, when the new pope came in, um, Pope Francis, and he learned that there was a, you heard of the Bishop of Bling? Remember that? The bishop up in Germany, I forget of which, which area, he had, a, I forget, he had a gold-plated bathtub that cost $10,000. Well, he was, when this new pope came on, he was quickly removed of his duties. 
because he was using you know, the, the, the goods of the church uh, for himself. And so if Joseph was found out to be using Pharaoh's stuff like it belonged to him and for his own good pleasure, then Joseph would be demoted, and in this case, back to prison. And so it's important for us to recognize that as stewards, as chief stewards of, of God's things, the things entrusted to us, that we have to refuse. Like we refuse to be an audience, we have to refuse to be owners. We can only be stewards. I'll give you a few examples. Uh, of course, finances are going to be part of this sermon series, so I'll start with that. Um, I used to make the mistake of saying, uh, I give 10% of my income to God. Right? I, I tithe. That's what I would say. What I should have said is, I choose to take home 90% of God's. It's all God's, right? I'm not giving God anything. It's a joke. I'm not giving God anything. I might be returning and withholding from God 10, uh, 90%, but I'm not giving God 10%. It's all his. He owns it. Uh, the greatest thing I've been given to steward, the greatest resource, if you will, that's a, not a good word, but I don't have one, uh, are two kids. God has handed me and handed Valerie two children and said, I trust you with them. You ask for them, here you go. Good luck, right? So God handed us these kids, and we're in charge of raising them up. But it's important to recognize that our role as parents, as a stewardship model, is to be uh, a guardians, almost in a foster care sense, because they truly belong to God. And when you recognize that your kids belong to God, it helps you pray better. It helps you hand things over to God. It makes the goal clear that when Christian is 18 years old, I hope he knows the same truth that I know, that the, the, the father of my dad... The Lord is also my father. I hope he knows that my father is also his father. That I'm just his earthly guardian. I've done my job. I've done my job if I can do that. Valerie's done her job if she can do that. And so children are given to us to steward. Your time. Did you know, and I said this at the beginning of our worship, that your time, the way you spend your time, the time is your currency of your life. You're spending it. You, did you know that you're spending a, an hour right now that you're not going to get back? You're spending your time that has been, not even, you're spending God's time that has been entrusted to you for many purposes to enjoy, to live, to bless, to learn, to grow. And so if you were to audit yourself, would you fire you? There are some weeks I'd fire me, right? The way you spend your time says a lot about the way you steward the time that has been given to you. Does that make sense? It's all God's. It's all God's. Your car. Oh, here it is. Here's the experiment for this, for this month. Okay. You have a car? I know college, college students, do you have a car? A bike, something? Okay. Now pretend for a minute. See, this is a biblical truth. Pretend that you're driving the company car. It's not your car. It's God's car. Okay. If you're driving the company car around, and have you ever driven a company car? You should drive it a little nicer, right, than your own car? I came from Dallas. I know some college students came from Dallas, too, and, and, and sometimes it's not easy to drive nice on the highway out there if you want to survive. The cars we drive, the trucks we drive, for example, are not ours. They've been entrusted to us. Now, we could do all these theological gymnastics and say, I worked really hard for mine. Then I'll just come right back at you and say, who gave you the time? Who gave you the talents? Who, gave, you know, right? who, who placed you in the United States of America and this fertile land to do well financially? But your car is the company car. It's God's car that he's letting you drive. Drive it accordingly. And even more, why don't you pull over once a day, shut it off and say a prayer, Lord, Thank you for trusting me with this beautiful resource. Is there anything that you would like me to do with it for your sake? Do I need to go drop a jug of milk off at someone's house? Do I need to swing by St. Benedict's and help them out? It's a homeless ministry. Do I need to, do I need to give that guy a ride? Ladies, don't do that. Don't, go, don't pick up hitchhikers. But do I need to go help somebody out with your car, Lord? Use my car or the car you've entrusted to me to bless others on the road. When was the last time you were sitting at a stoplight and you prayed for everybody around you? You're driving the company car. You're home. Your dorm room. I know it's tempting to think, well, I pay the mortgage payment. It's mine. No. Biblically, God has entrusted you this beautiful home. Yes, to take care of it. 
Yes, to enjoy. God gives you things to enjoy, right? But while you're resting and sleeping and partying and enjoying and having fun in your home, in the home God's given you, why don't you stop and ask, Lord, is there anything you would like me to use your home for? Do I host a Bible study? At the very least, can you bless my home and use it as a blessing to our neighbors? When people walk past, may they be blessed. Claim my home, God. Reclaim it. Be careful when you invite the preacher over to your house, too, because I always say a prayer. Lord, claim this home as an extension of your church. Reclaim it. Own it. Your bodies. The scriptures say that we were purchased. We were purchased at a high price. And we aren't our own. Your own body doesn't belong to you. Talk about one of the greatest resources you've ever received. Right? You're fearfully and wonderfully made. Are you taking good care of your temple? Are you enjoying it? Are you using it as a blessing to others? So as you can see, this this idea of stewardship is huge. It's not just a... Uh, let's, let's talk about money once, once every year and, and make budget. That's not what this is about. Stewardship is it's one of the top three. And, and the top, if I were writing a book, this, these are the chapters I would write. Number one is Christians are called to be ambassadors of the kingdom of God. We're supposed to live like we know God. We're supposed to, if you and I met somebody from Germany, we would expect them to represent Germany, right? When people meet a Christian, they ought to expect us to represent God's holy kingdom. That's a huge category. Second thing is Christians are called to go fishing. We're going to get to that. We're called to go out and share Christ with others, to evangelize, to spread the good news. I know that makes you wiggle in your seat a little bit, but we'll get to it. And just as high as those two is that Christians are called to be holy, honorable stewards. We should be taking care of things better than than, than most of the world. Our relationships ought to be beautiful. Our children ought to be loved. Our finances ought to be in order. Our homes ought to be used for good. Our cars ought to be driven ways that, that, that Christ would be, that we'd be glad about. We are called to take care of the things entrusted to us. Now, of course, this includes finances, and so we'll get to that next week. But I want you to see what an honor it is that Jesus Christ and the Father have looked upon you and says, I trust you. I trust you with time, money, kids. What an honor. What an honor. I can't say it all today, but here's one basic biblical truth with stewardship. I want you to recognize this. Stewards that steward wisely, that are trustworthy, that do their job faithfully, they're entrusted with more. I'll use money as an example. If you're bad with money, if you're not good to it, it leaves you. And it goes to people who are good with money. If you're bad with your relationships... If you're awful, if you're abusive, the people you love, your relationships, they leave you, don't they? Take care of the things that have been given to you. Good stewards are entrusted with even more. And people who are poor stewards have even what they have, the scriptures say, removed from them. And this whole sermon series, my hope is with worship in the last three weeks, my hope is with stewardship that you see big traction in your home life in your relationships, in your, in your finances, in the way you treat your body, the way you drive. My prayer is that stewardship happens in the home better than anywhere else because this has, I've got to make this absolutely clear. You're going to hear it a lot from me. Stewardship is not tithing. Stewardship is not giving to a church. Stewardship is what you do with the 90% you take home. Stewardship is what you do with your life outside of church. Stewardship is what, how you live and you take care of everything else in your life. I want the members and the friends of First Christian Church to be known in this town as some of the most honorable, the most respectable, the most joyful, generous, the most loving and compassionate stewards in this town. I have the same prayer for First Baptist, Broadway Baptist, the Catholic Church. What would it mean in our community if when people drove past our churches, they thought there are some of the most generous people I've ever seen? The question is not whether or not you're a steward. The question is, are you a good one? Let's pray. Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, 
We ask a, a blessing upon all the things you've given us. We pray as Joseph was handed an incredible opportunity by Pharaoh, that we would recognize incredible opportunities we've been handed by you, by your very hand. We pray that we would remember that you own it all. You own a, the cattle on a thousand hills. You own the hills, Lord. We pray, Father, that we would be useful to you. We pray that you would see that you can give through us and that you would give to us to bless others. We pray that this month you would open your storehouse for us and bless us as good stewards. We pray that you wouldn't curse us with a blessing, that you wouldn't give us something that would be good for some people, but for us, Father, it would destroy us. We don't want to be destroyed, Lord. Hand us what we're called to, equipped to, and able to steward today. We pray that you would bless our congregation as a good steward of discipleship. Bless us, Father, with many more families and, 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 and folks to pastor and disciple. Find us a worthy steward, we pray. And Lord, we ask of the things that we are currently taking care of on your behalf. We pray that you would show us what to use them for. Help us see it creatively. And may we be faithful to you. It's in the name of Jesus we ask. Amen.